garment of praise. Mm. Hallelujah. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. Thank you, Lord. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Holding on. This is how I fight my battles. Standing on His word. This is how I fight my battles. Speaking the word this of life. This is how I fight my battles. Praise Him all day long. This is how I fight my battles. Worshiping my God. This is how I fight my battles. Fight on my knees. This is how I fight. our battles because we are surrounded by God hallelujah I'd like to welcome us to church this morning it's good to see us here in the presence of the Lord and I also like to use this opportunity to welcome our online congregation today we're here not just because we felt like coming but we're here because God gave us the opportunity to be here you know with everything going on in the world we're wondering how we will make the next day 
It's like we're living in, in fear. It's like we're living in shame with rejection and guilt surrounding us. But by the blood of Christ, all those things are washed away and they've been taken away from us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being God. For the opportunity you've given us today, Lord, to see this day in good health and good life. Even though the enemy might try to take our joy from us, you still remain strong in us. Heaven and earth may fade away, Lord, but your word remains strong. Not just strong in our lives, but strong in the lives of our families, in the lives of our loved ones, even the lives of strangers. Heavenly Father, we commit this service into your holy hands. And we ask that you bless us with your presence, O oh God. For every activity which takes place today, Lord, we commit into your hands. Let it be according to your will and according to your purpose for our lives in Jesus' name. We also co commit our brethren, O oh Lord, both those far and near having this service today, Lord. We ask that you keep them safe and sound in the name of Jesus. And for those who are hiding, and cannot come in public to serve you, oh God. You know their hearts. We ask that you bless them and you touch them too in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for our pastors. Even as they come on this pulpit and they speak forth into our life, they, don't, they would not speak death, but Lord, they will speak life into our lives in the name of Jesus. And we ask that you bless them too and you bless their households, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for blessing our heart desires. Thank you for your word in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Enjoy the service. Hallelujah. Can we put those hands together for Jesus? Come on. Hallelujah. Come on. There is a name above every other name. Do you know that name? What's that name? What's that name? At the mention of that name, the Bible says every knee and every thumb. Come on, celebrate Jesus in the house. Come on. He is the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands. Come on. Ha.
Jesus. Provision in that name. Things change when we call that name. There is no other name that has been given unto us but Jesus. Oh, Father, we bless your name. We know the God that we trust. We worship your Father. And we stand in your congregation and we declare that the name of Jesus is strong, powerful. So much power in that name. The potency in that name is unbelievable. It's unreal. There is power in that name of Jesus. I'm a living witness what the power of Jesus can do. Oh, we worship you. So we call the name of Jesus. He is a healer. Is he your healer? Call the name of Jesus. Ha. He is our provider every day. Call the name of Jesus. He is our protector. Name of Jesus, He is our deliverer. Yeah. Oh, 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 everybody. Come on, call that name. He is your healer. If you're sick in your body, call that name. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's your provider. Provider. Say, call the name. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's your protector every day. Protector. Every day, every day, every day. Call the name. Jesus. He's our deliverer.
name of Jesus He is your healer If you believe it Call the name Jesus He is your provider Call the name Jesus If you need a protector Your protector is here Jesus, your deliverer, he's a deliverer, a deliverer, that's who he is, that's who he is, that's who he is, I call him my healer, I call him my provider, I call him my protector, I call him my Jesus, he's everything to me, yes he is, oh Jesus, you are, hey, yeah. So we call the name Jesus, 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 Jesus,
the prayer for revival today I would like us to start by taking a look at Philippians 4 verse 6 in the message version and it says don't worry about anything instead pray about everything tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done the news and statistics regarding killings stabbings the poisonings the retali retaliatory actions that threaten to topple diplomatic relations. These are all things that we can reasonably worry about. In fact, they could threaten to keep us up at night. They are potent, fiery darts that the enemy could attempt to shoot straight into our hearts. However, this afternoon, let us do as the Bible commands. Let us start by giving thanks. There's so much for us to be thankful for. Let's thank God that he's omniscient, that he knows all things. He has the answers to all questions. Thank God that he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. The devil and his agents, they're finite. They cannot be in several places at the same time. This means that when we're out, when our children are out, when our loved ones are going out, God is right there. He's ahead of us. He's leading us in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. 
Let's thank God that we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with us and he lives to forever make intercession for us the saints. Let us thank God that he hears us, that he answers our prayers. Let us thank God for the remnant that haven't bowed their knees to the false gods of this age. Let us thank God for the growth and the unification of the church. Let's thank God for the faithfulness of the saints by his grace. Church, let us thank God. Let us reflect on the faithfulness of God so far, the things that he has done, the things that he continues to do, the fact that he's with us, the fact that he's been steadfast, the fact that he's granted us the grace and the passion, the sustenance to keep praying, the fact that he hears us, the confidence we have in him. Let us thank God for salvation. Let us thank God for the progress that is being made. Let us thank God for every day keeping us. Let us thank God for healing. Let us thank God for deliverance. Let us thank God for his word, the potency of his word. Church, let us thank God. Let us give glory to God. Let us praise him. Let us exalt him. Let us let him know that we are grateful, that we see his hand in everything, that we thank him for his faithfulness. And if I can have Ezekiel 37 verses 1 to 14 on the screen in the NIV. This let us remember that in, in Philippians 4, 6, which we just looked at, we're instructed to tell God what we want. In this, this um, number of verses in Ezekiel that we're looking at, verses 1 to 14, Ezekiel prophesied to the dry bones according to the word of the Lord, and they lived again. So as we've also learned in Philippians 4, 6, let us prophesy the revival that we desire in our land. Let us remind God of his promises. He says to us in Psalm 2, verse 8, in the Amplified, he says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth as your possession. Let us prophesy this revival into the United Kingdom. Let us prophesy, church. Father Lord, in our streets, in our schools, in hospitals, all across the land, Father Lord, we prophesy the revival. Father Lord, let every Every dry bone live again, oh Lord. Father, Lord, bring back to life everything that is dead, oh Lord. Every soul that hasn't yet recognized your Lordship, oh Lord. Let the knowledge of you cover this earth, oh Lord, like the waters cover the sea. Father, Lord, let the Lordship of Christ reign supreme. Father, Lord, satisfy our nation with Christ as our ultimate desire. Father, Lord, let there be revival in all the land. Father, Lord, from the youth, oh Lord, to the older, oh Lord. Father, Lord, to the professionals, oh Lord, everyone. Father, Lord, let the worship of Yahweh be our watchword once again, O oh Lord. Father, Lord, we prophesy peace, we prophesy unity, we prophesy joy, we prophesy, Father, Lord, an outbreak, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit all over this land, O oh Lord. Father, Lord, we reclaim this nation for Christ. We remind you of your word, O oh Lord. Father, Lord, give us this land. Father, Lord, give us this land for Christ, O oh Lord. Father, Lord, we are so grateful and thankful that you have heard us. Whenever we go out, church, let us also remember his word in Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. In the Amplified Classic Version, it says, Be strong, courageous, and firm. Fear not, nor be in terror before them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Before we take our seats for seven years, I'd like us to also take a moment to appreciate the leadership of the church and ourselves for being so consistent about praying for the nation, knowing that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man makes tremendous power available in its working. Let's appreciate our leadership and ourselves. And so, Father Lord, as we go out into the into the back into the world oh lord father lord even as we worship in this service every day of our lives we just ask for more grace oh lord to be fervent in prayer we thank you that you hear us oh lord father lord we thank you that all things are working together for our good oh lord because we love you and we're called according to your purpose and we thank you father lord that revival is happening in this land that you're faithful that you hear us oh lord and that you indeed have answered we look forward to the manifestation of revival in this land in jesus name amen Please take your seats for seven years, Judge. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Seven News. Our monthly prayer meeting takes place on Friday the 27th of April from 8pm in the Worship Centre. This is an opportunity for us to come together to pray for our nation, the church and ourselves as we continue to believe God for a revival. 
and please remember that this is just one of many opportunities to get involved in prayer at Jesus House. We have our prayer webinars every Monday, Wednesday and Friday from 6am to 6.30 where you can log in and pray alongside other members via an online service. We also meet Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7pm in the chapel. We encourage you to plug into as many of these sessions as possible to connect with God and to pray for the nation and ourselves. Jesus House Francophonie, our French-speaking church, will be holding an event called Revive Me Lord on Friday the 13th and Saturday the 14th of July at Jesus House from 7pm. This event is open to everyone and is absolutely free. So please bring your friends, your family, your neighbours. We look forward to seeing you there. <laughs> Calling all parents of young people between the ages of 13 and 21 at Jesus House. This year's annual Rock Youth Retreat will take place at Kingswood Activity Centre in Ashford between Friday the 27th and Sunday the 29th of July. The Youth Retreat is one of the standout events for the Youth Ministry and at the heart of this trip is a chance for every young person to focus on themselves and their relationship with God by eliminating the countless distractions faced in day-to-day -day life, engage with other young people with the hope of building new friendships, explore new locations in a group setting and learn to be more independent, and of course have lots of fun. The cost of this trip is £75 which includes transportation. The registration deadline is Sunday the 29th of April so please visit the information desk in the foyer after the service where you can register your child. A deposit of £20 will also be required to secure their place. Jesus House will be holding an event on Saturday the 28th of April from 10am where the special guest speaker will be Dr. O.K. Anuza. Dr. Anuza will be teaching us about governance prayers and the coming of the Kingdom of God. This is a one day workshop with in-depth teaching on how to pray. So if you have a burden for the nation, especially in light of the gun and knife crime currently prevalent in London, then please do come along to what is set to be a fantastic day of empowerment for God's glory. The Uncommon Woman Conference will be held from Thursday the 24th of May to Saturday the 26th of May. This year we have the Inspire Kids and your kids are in for a lot of fun so don't let them miss out. Please visit uncommonwomanconference.co.uk for more information and to purchase your tickets. The registration deadline for the Kids First Summer Camp is fast approaching. The purpose of the trip is for the children to explore Christianity in a different environment and to support them to grow in their relationship with God. For more information, please send an email to kidsfirstevents at gmail.com by the 29th of April. Thy Kingdom Come is a global prayer movement which invites Christians around the world to pray between Ascension and Pentecost for more people to come to know Jesus Christ. On Sunday the 20th of May at 6.30pm, Pastor Agu, Archbishop Justin Welby and other ministers will gather together at Methodist Central Hall on Pentecost Sunday for an evening of prayer and praise. For more information and to register, please visit pentecostbeacon.eventbrite.uk That's all for this week's 7 News. Here's a recap of this week's stories. To re-watch, please visit our YouTube page or the Jesus House website. And remember, we are a social church and you can follow us on all the main social networking sites where our handle is at Jesus House UK. Goodbye and have a blessed week.
Good afternoon, church. How is everyone? Good, good. So as mentioned on 7 News, um, the Uncommon Women Conference is coming up in less than a month, and it's on the 24th of May to the 26th. And I'm really just here to encourage every woman to come to this conference, and not just for themselves, but for everyone. Um, as you know, our theme is inspire. So we really need people to come to this conference, to be inspired by the speakers so that we can inspire our communities and our next generation. And I'm not just saying this for the sake of saying it. I'm saying it based on my own personal experience. I went to the conference last year and I was truly touched. The breakout session was so insightful and the speakers were inspiring and it really just brought a lot of clarity into my own life. Um, we also have a speaker called Kika Ashenike who will be speaking and she's a young woman who's on fire for God. She leads her own ministry called Pure Hearts and it's all about restoring young women's hearts to Jesus. And she's really relatable, funny, and she really speaks about the word of God in a practical way. Um, so tickets can be bought on uncommonwomenconference.co.uk and they're £15 for anyone who's 21 or under and £30 for everyone else. And I really want to stress that this isn't just a ticket, it's an investment. Um, the amount of prayer, deliverance, you know, clarity and wisdom that can be found in this conference can transform your life. So it's not just 15 or 30 pounds is an, yeah, it's an investment into your life. So yeah, I, I hope to see you all there. <laughs> Praise God. Go on, appreciate everyone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 She had so much energy. <laughs> Praise God. Now, one of the things that we need uh, for that conference is we, we, um, we want as many guys as possible to serve in, in various capacities so that we can release the ladies um, to be blessed in the conference. So for that to happen, guys, we've got to volunteer either one day or all the days or or a few hours, whatever you can give for that conference. So let, let me see the guys who can, who will, who will be real men and volunteer to serve. Thank you. Keep that hand up for a second. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay, are we, can we give those forms out, ushers? Yeah. If there's a guy sitting next to you and his hand is not up, ask him, are you okay? <laughs> guys, guys, please, let's, let's, Let's serve. Let's serve the ladies. Let's serve the ladies. Yeah. Thank you. God bless you guys. Yeah. Can you fill those forms? We're, we're going to um, take them back from you uh, before the service is over. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. We um, we're all aware. Of, um, there's, there's some microphone on somewhere that keeps speaking back. We're all aware of uh, the challenges on, on our streets, especially in some of our boroughs, um, and we're responding to it as the church in various capacities. Um, one of the ways that we are responding to it is by uh, uh, calling a prayer walk in some of the which one is it? Amen. We're, 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 we're calling a prayer walk in some of the boroughs um, over the next few Sundays. This Sunday, we're in Tottenham, um, and we'd like to encourage as many of you as possible to come. Uh, we meet at the town hall in Tottenham um, at 3.30. The, walk, the prayer walk starts at 4 o'clock. Um, we believe in God that is not just something symbolic, it is, but we're believing that as we walk those streets and pray with um, brothers and sisters from other churches, that something will break spiritually. Um, and, and, and this spirit that wants to shed the blood of young people will be driven back to the pits of hell. 
Amen. So please, if you want to come, um, the town hall, we start the walk at 4 o'clock. If you're coming by Tube, Seven Sisters, Sisters Tube Station, apparently it's the nearest Tube Station. If you're driving, that's okay. The town hall is ideally situated. There's a, a large car park right next to it if you are driving. But um, hope I, I'll see some of you there. And if you're not coming, then do pray for the march. Pray that it will achieve God's plans and God's purposes for it. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. We, we, um, we've been talking for the last uh, three Sundays. This is, will be the third one. About the fiery darts of, of Satan. <laughs> About the fiery darts of Satan. Um, thank you. I appreciate the tribe, please. Uh, it's, a, it's a series that, that God laid on my heart. And it, it, it finds its, it takes its source from Paul's teaching to the church at Ephesus. Thank you. In Ephesians, the fifth, the sixth chapter, um, and you know the you know the, 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 the scriptures where Paul encourages us in this battle against this organized hierarchy of evil um, that he outlines from verse 12, and he encourages us to stand against this army of Satan uh, by putting on an armor. And in verse 16, he talks about. A part of the armor, the shield of faith, with which you will quench the fiery darts of the enemy. And that's where the title for the series comes from, the fiery darts of the enemy. We spoke initially about, when we started, we spoke about the fiery dart of fear. And then we spoke about the fiery dart of rejection. And today we want to talk about the fiery darts of shame and it's, a, it's companion guilt. Now, I think this is arguably the oldest of all the fiery darts. Because if we go right literally to the beginning of the Bible, um, the, the third chapter, uh, we, we, there's a, there, we have, there's, a, there's an encounter that takes place, there's a series of events that takes, takes place that will form the basis of my teaching of my sermon this afternoon. So if we turn to Genesis, the third chapter, the third chapter of the book of Genesis, I'm going to read from the message. Um, it doesn't matter what your translation is, but uh, the story is the same, but the language in the message helps me drive home what I'm about to share with you. Genesis, the third chapter from the first verse. The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. He spoke to the woman, Do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, Not at all. We can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only about the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, Don't eat from it. Don't even touch it or you'll die. The serpent told the woman, You won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God, knowing everything, ranging all the way from good to evil. When the woman saw that the tree looked like good eating and realized what, what she would get out of it, she'd know everything. She took and ate the fruit and then gave some to her husband and he ate. Immediately, the two of them did see what's really going on, saw themselves naked. They sewed fig leaves together as makeshift clothes for themselves. When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze, the man and his wife hid in the trees of the garden, hid from God. God called to the man, where are you? He said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. God said, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you gave me as a companion, she gave me fruit from the tree and yes, I ate it. God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? 
The serpent seduced me, she said, and I, and I ate. Amen. One of the deadliest darts that the enemy can throw at anyone, a Christian especially, is the dart of shame or its companion guilt. The enemy's intention is clear. In throwing these darts, he wants to stop you and I from living the fullness of life, becoming who God wants us to become, from fulfilling God's plans and purposes for our lives. He wants to ensure that we, rather than run, we limp through life. He wants to hinder, he wants to obstruct. He really wants to fulfill the ministry that Jesus makes clear is his ministry in John the 10th chapter and the 10th verse. The thief, Jesus says, comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I mean, we are grateful that it doesn't stop there. Because he says, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. One translation says that you might have life to the overflow. Another translation says that you might have the fullness of life. It is God's plan that we should have life to the overflow. We should have the fullness of life. It is God's plan that we should enter every promise that he has for us. But then the enemy has his own plan. And he has his own minions, his own army to bring to pass his own plan. Paul hi highlights that hierarchy there of wickedness that is arrayed against you and I to stop us from living life to the fullness or living life to the overflow. And nowhere does he achieve this in, in, in a clearer way, maybe a foundational way, than when he throws the arrows of shame and guilt. Where he gets us to do things that he knows will lead to shame and guilt where he gets us to rebel against God, to sin against God, to, in effect, put aside the protection that we have to stop the fiery darts. For you see, when we rebel, when we are disobedient to God, when we don't do what he wants us to do, we are, in effect, laying down the shield in the midst of war. And we are exposed to the fiery darts of the enemy. For the shield is really our obedience to God's word. It's really our trust in God. And when we do the exact opposite, we lay down the shield and expose ourselves to the fiery darts of the enemy. And that's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve. And the consequences the world lived with until Jesus came back to correct it. The dysfunction that arose as a result of the shame and guilt that attached itself to them and those who came after them simply because of their actions. And these, their, their story tells us almost in a sequential order what happens when shame and guilt attaches itself to a person as a result of their actions. In verse 7, the first thing the Bible tells us is that the, the enemy's plan by bringing shame or, or bringing the burden of guilt, the weight of guilt, the stigma of shame into a person's life, the first thing the enemy wants is to make the person feel naked. They say there in verse 7 that we are naked. You feel exposed. You feel vulnerable. And I'm sure we've all been there at one time or the other. Where we've done something that is just not what we should have done with regards to our relationship with God. And a feeling of nakedness follows us. A feeling that we are exposed. That we are vulnerable. The second thing that happens is that naturally... The moment we feel there is shame as a result of our actions or guilt, we try to cover it up. 
The Bible says there about them that they sewed fig leaves together as soon as they knew they were naked and made makeshift clothes. That's what the Message Bible says. They tried in their natural abilities to cover up something that was shameful and something that had brought guilt into their lives. They didn't go to the root cause of the shame and the guilt, but they tried to create some sort of covering that would allow them to continue to live life. And isn't that how a lot of us can be? Where there's been an incident that has brought shame to our hearts, that has put guilt in our hearts, the rock of guilt, the burden of it, the weight of it. And instead of going to the root of that incident to deal with it, we somehow try to create some facade so that we can get on with life. We create makeshift clothes, hoping that we can get on with life. The third thing that happens if we don't deal with the root cause is that we inevitably end up hiding from God. Isn't it instructive in verse 8, in the, the message, verse 8, that rather than go to God, which is where we should go, Adam and Eve are hiding from God. It would, we can presuppose that what the Bible talks about, God coming down to stroll, to, to take a walk in the evening in Eden, was a regular occurrence. And he obviously must have been doing that. And whenever he did that, they would run to him. But this time, because there was this shame and this, this stigma, this stain, uh, this burden, this guilt, rather than run to him, they ran away from him. And in real life, that tends to happen. Where the weight of the guilt drives us away instead of to God. Number four, shame and guilt will always create an atmosphere of fear. Fear expressed in many ways and for many reasons. The fear of discovery. The fear of not being able to cope with the weight and the consequences of the shame and the guilt. The fear that loved ones might experience the same thing that brought about the shame and the guilt. And the fears go on and on and on. If shame and guilt are not dealt with at their roots, they create an atmosphere of fear. And you find many people, as a result of something, can't go, go forward in life because there's the fear, the fear of failure, the fear of the thing repeating itself. And the list goes on and on and on. Number five, if we don't go to the root of what brought about the shame and the guilt, we will invariably blame others. It will always be someone else's fault that I am carrying this shame or I'm dealing with this guilt. So rather than Adam and Eve own up, and accept their part in what had transpired. When God said to Adam what happened, Adam said, the woman you gave me caused it. When God said to the woman what happened, the woman said the serpent caused it. Now, it would have been interesting to see what would, the serpent would say if God had asked the serpent. But then, God's action in that particular instance gives us hope his action in dealing with their shame their nakedness their vulnerability the guilt they felt points us to the fulfillment in the expression of his son as the solution in verse 21 what does god do he kills an animal, takes the hide of the animal with the blood on it, and wraps it around them. Now that tells us that it is only the blood that can cover nakedness. But it's a symbol 
of a, a later time when blood will be shed that will cover my shame, your shame, my nakedness, your nakedness, my vulnerability, your vulnerability. The blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. But then that was where it was obvious that it was the actions of the people. Their part in the, their, 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 the part they played that brought about the shame and guilt. But sometimes in life, it's the actions of others. And sometimes, it's just life circumstances that conspire to create a situation that leaves one dealing with shame and guilt. Sometimes, it's, it's not because someone has done something wrong, but just life has happened. And because that person didn't have the shield of faith in place, the enemy has taken advantage of, the, of life that has happened and has launched a fiery dart and it has found its target in that person's life. The woman who hemorrhaged for 12 years, the woman with the issue of blood, we call her. As I thought about this, this, this sermon, I thought of that woman her story is recorded in three of the Gospels, Matthew 9, verse 20 to 22. And I thought about how life's circumstances had just conspired to bring this shameful thing to her. And the state of mind of that woman as she was ostracized by her community. As people she knew turned away from her just because of life's circumstances as she carried the shame and maybe the guilt that can sometimes come irrationally because it wasn't any fault of hers. And it wasn't until she touched Jesus' garment that the circumstances were healed and opened the way for the shame and the guilt to be taken away. But easily the story that drives home this point more than any must be the story of the Samaritan woman. A woman who had had the worst of life thrown at her. Five failed marriages. So much so that the sixth one, she didn't even bother to try with marriage. She just entered some relationship where she was living with the man. The stigma of the failed marriages. The shame she must have carried. The guilt, perchance, that she would have carried. Thinking if there are five failed marriages, surely there must be something wrong with me that has caused these marriages to fail. The weight of it all on her, on her. It's no wonder that when she goes to the well to draw water, the Bible says she goes at the sixth hour, John the fourth chapter. The sixth hour is 12 noon. Nobody went to the well at 12 noon because that was when the sun was at, at, at its highest, it was hottest, it was most uncomfortable. She chooses a time to go to the well when she knows nobody will be there because obviously the shame and the guilt that she's carrying in her heart. But thankfully for her, Jesus was there. In the same way that I'm saying to someone, Jesus is here for you. And she meets him, has an encounter with him. He starts by asking her to give him water to drink. By the end of the encounter, she has, she has such an experience in that encounter that the very woman who was hiding, ostracized, running away, ashamed, goes back to the town and becomes the mouthpiece of Christ, an evangelist for God, Telling the very people that she was running away from about this man who she had met, who obviously had healed her and made her whole. In my time serving as a pastor, I have spoken to countless people who have dealt with shame and guilt. I have, in my own personal life, dealt with shame and guilt. 
And out of the countless people I've spoken to, I've found that some things feature more than others. As things that have brought shame and guilt into our lives. And I've chosen the top 10 of these things that I have dealt with in my time serving as a pastor. Number one, people who have faced a lot of humiliation as a child, people who were teased relentlessly, embarrassed constantly, even humiliated, and it's worst where it was by people who should have loved and protected them. I found people who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s. A lady who's in her late 40s and could remember vividly the incidents that took place when she was growing up, when her father humiliated her in front of the whole family a lot of times and in front of strangers completely scarred her the the sh the shame of those years i'm talking to a 40 something year old woman and it hasn't left her some of the things that happened end up shaping people's personalities They've become who they are. They've acquired personality traits. Sometimes they've become defensive simply because of something that happened that was never dealt with. Number two, people who grew up with parents that did things that were shameful. People who grew up in homes where there were where there was a lot of domestic violence, a lot of verbal abuse, physical violence. The children generally are ashamed of that kind of home. Some children even feel guilty because somehow the enemy tells them a lie that a lot of these things are happening because of them. People who grew up in homes where the parents have addictions, alcohol, alcohol, alcoholic addiction, drug, drug, drug addictions, and other kinds of addictions. Number three, people who grow up in dysfunctional homes. There's a proclivity, there's an opening for shame and guilt to attach itself. I've known people who, who create fictional homes, young children, simply because they can't handle the reality of what home is like. I'm sure you have heard of young girls who, because the father has just, just abandoned the family, they go to school and create a fictional father because they are ashamed to let their peers know what their father has done and who their father is really like. And so for years, their peers think, think that they have a father at home. The shame has allowed them literally to create another life. And usually when you meet such people in later life who are ashamed, you see, because the truth is that your past shouldn't make you ashamed. Your past should be a testimony. Because look at you and look at where you're coming from. That should be the story. But the enemy tells you a lie that that past makes you less than you are. And you believe the lie. So you meet people and you get close to them. You don't know anything about their past. It's natural to talk about your past. It's natural to reminisce. It's natural to reflect. It's natural to use what happened to, tell, to explain what is happening. But you meet, you meet some people, you know nothing about their past. What school did you go to? Don't know. How did you grow up? Don't know. What happened while you were growing up? Don't know. And yet I'm close to you or you're close to the person, there's something wrong. 
the person is hiding something that they are ashamed about and that they can't see. And it's understandable because that's the fiery dart of shame or guilt that has found its target. Number four. There are many things the enemy can accuse us of, but one that I find recurs is the accusation the enemy brings where someone has been involved in an abortion. I've cancelled many people. Where I say to them, it happened, yes. But you've confessed it. He's forgiven you. But they say it just doesn't go away. The enemy tells them that that abortion, that child, it is too weighty for God to forgive it. And so people carry that shame and the guilt around in their lives. A pastor friend of mine told me a story that he said he's been pastoring for years but it just won't go away. How he was involved with an abortion and they got rid of the child. And he says to me that he can still hear the thud. This is 30 or 40 years later. When they flung the child that they got rid of the, the, the fetus into a bush. He says he can still, he wakes up sometimes still hearing the thud that, that, that he heard then as the child hit the ground, the fetus. The devil is trying to say to him, you are guilty forever for that thing that you did. Number five, an extramarital affair. How the devil hangs that shame and that guilt. And so a person or a couple just can't go past that affair that took place. Number six, sexual sin. The shame and the guilt that the enemy hangs on someone who's caught in sex, some sexual sin or the other. I've seen a grown man burst into tears because of the guilt he felt and the shame because he was trapped in this cycle of pornography. A grown man, a, 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 a man's man seen him bust I saw him bust into tears because the guilt was just too much the guilt that someone feels cancelled in this area when the cycle of masturbation just can't be just seems not to be broken and the person is just weighed down and the sexual sin can go on and on and on with the enemy just whispering into your ears that God, God cannot take you seriously. You can't expect to be blessed by God. What if people knew what you get up to? And the guilt, the shame, just seems unbearable. Number seven, and this touches my heart, the guilt and shame a person feels when they've been sexually abused is painful because the person is already a victim. Someone took advantage of them. Someone sexually abused them. It is even more weighty in terms of shame and guilt when the person is someone who should have protected or loved, you just need to ask a girl who has been abused sexually by her father. The shame and the guilt by an uncle, 
by a brother, by some, someone who should have been there to protect them. And I know about the shame and guilt of sexual abuse because I was sexually abused myself from the age of five, four, four, five. We, during the, the Nigerian Civil War, we left the city and moved through a series of towns for safety. And because we were living in the countryside, the toilets were an outhouse. So to go to the toilet at four or five, I couldn't go on my own. So one of our house helps would be asked to take me to the toilets. And that's where she started abusing me. I didn't know it was abuse then. She just made me do stuff to her and she did stuff to me. And it continued till my teens. Constantly. And I know the, the shame I used to feel when I would come back into the house and my parents would be there and I, I dared not tell them. Because of course, she had told me that if I told them, all kinds of terrible things would happen to me and I was four or five years old, I believed it. And by the time I was 10 or 11 or 12, when I could have talked, I was actually beginning to enjoy whatever the abuse was, so it didn't matter. And there are many who are in that place. There are many whose lives have been marred. There are many who can't go into a wholesome relationship because of the abuse that they've suffered. Then there's the shame and the guilt of it. Because something, one thing with sexual abuse is that it's so irrational. You were abused, but sometimes you feel that you caused it. I used to feel that I, I brought this upon myself. How come she's not abusing my brother? How come she's not abusing this other person? And I felt that I brought it upon myself. And you know, it's worse where you even tell people and the people say, rather than deal with it, let's not bring shame to the family. It's a, it's a, it's a double stab. Number eight, where a person has a disability or where there's a disability in the family. I knew a family that I, I, I grew up with. It was years later that I found out that they had a sibling. Can you beat that? Because they had hidden the sibling away because the sibling had a disability, some, some serious learning disability. And they were so ashamed of the sibling that they hid the sibling away. They grew up carrying the shame in their hearts of this their dark secret. So one day, it was impossible to continue to live like that. I had a young boy who is 14, 15, 14, who has a severely disabled sister. When he expressed his hurt and his pain, his uncle and myself were simply flabbergasted. Over, we just could not believe the intensity of the pain that he had carried for eight, since he was eight years old or so, about his sister's disability, severe disability. When he, told, when he spoke about the harsh words he had to endure in school, I knew that this boy is scarred for life and only Jesus can heal him. Number 
nine, the last one. The shame that comes from an involvement in something that was criminal. The guilt of an involvement in something that was criminal. A theft or something. The weight of carrying that around. But then how do we deal with it? The truth, if it's a fiery dart of the enemy, there are no psychiatrists, psychologists, and psychoanalysts, or whatever else they're called, doctors, counselors, mentors, that can help you. Except they understand that real freedom comes from Christ. And then they are used by Christ to bring freedom. The Bible says in John 8 verse 36, If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. It is only the freedom that comes from the Son that is real freedom. But then provision has been made by God for our freedom. For freedom from shame and freedom from guilt. But if we don't come to that provision, we remain under the weight. What, one, what the Bible calls the brutal tyranny of the shame and the guilt. If we come to Jesus, for this reason was the Son of God manifested to destroy these kinds of works of darkness. But come, we must. And so what solution do I present? Jesus, that's the only solution I know. Paul says in Romans 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You come to Christ, then there is now no condemnation. You, I can share it because it's now a, tes it's a testimony. There is no condemnation anymore. And I like the way the message puts that scripture and the second verse. It says this, listen to this. With the arrival of Jesus the Messiah... That fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ like a strong wind has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a fated lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. Celebrate the word of God, please. The foundation of anything that Satan does is a lie or lies. So it is Satan that says you can't get rid of that shame. That guilt is going to be with you till you die. And so how do we deal with that? We must displace the lies with the truth. But the challenge that the church has is that the truth is in the word of God. It is the truth that you know that sets you free. If you don't know the truth, then freedom doesn't come. If we're not applying ourselves to the Word of God constantly, daily, studying, reading, meditating, confessing the Word of God. For the shield of faith is made out of the Word of God. It is trust in what God has said. Trust in His promises and trust in His person. 
And we can't trust in him if we don't know him. We can't know him if we don't read what he said about himself. We can't know the promise that we have to hold on to and trust in if we have never come across the promise. If we are coming to church on Sunday and that's about the only time that there's a reference in our lives to the Bible, it is impossible to live a victorious life. It has to be the Word of God. And when we, when we then imbibe the Word, we build that shield of faith and the fiery darts of the enemy can't find their place. We get to know God's nature and God's person and trust his nature and his person. See what the Apostle John says in 1 John, the first chapter and the 8th, 9th and 10th verse. And this is the amplified version. 1 John 1, 8, 9 and 10. He says, if we say we have no sin, refusing to admit that we are sinners... We delude ourselves and the truth is not in us. His word does not live in our hearts. If we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, he is faithful and just, true to his nature and promises, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us continually from all unrighteousness, our wrongdoing, everything not in conformity with his will and purpose if we say that we have not sinned refusing to admit acts of sin we make him out to be a liar by contradicting him and his word is not in us so what's the solution It's Christ what's the solution It's coming to God asking for forgiveness confessing and is trusting in God. Trusting that he is who he says he is. The Bible says there that his default nature is to forgive and to continually cleanse from all unrighteousness. And that leads me to the last thing. It is true that there are certain stains that are indelible. There are certain stains that are difficult to wash off. There are certain things that, have been, that we have done or that have been done to us that have stained our nature, that have become blemishes, stigmas, that it is difficult to erase. But then, that's why our Lord and Savior shed his blood. For there is no stain on this earth that the blood of Jesus can't wipe away. John says in 1 John 1 verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There's no stain of shame. There's no mark of guilt that is so strong that it attaches itself to us and cannot be raised by the blood of Jesus. That's why the accuser does not want the church to fully understand the potent, potency of the blood of Jesus. Because he wants to continually accuse us. He wants to go before God and have the evidence to accuse us. But do you know as I end that this God that has perfect knowledge this God that knows all things this God that numbers the stars and calls them by name that knows every strand of hair not just on my head on your head 
on the heads of everybody this God that has this 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 absolute knowledge that our limited knowledge we struggle to understand when the blood of Jesus is applied and wipes away the accuser of the brethren goes to this God to say can you see what she did or what he did the only time that this God says I can't remember is when the blood of Jesus has been applied So this God chooses himself to have a selective amnesia. He chooses because of his unfailing love for you and I to say, I'm God, I know everything. But this one, I don't see it. It doesn't exist. It's been wiped away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Can someone say amen? no detergent no chemical no cleaning agent no bleach can wipe away some things but then no shame no guilt can resist the purifying cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ that blood was shed for you and I so that we don't have to carry this shame anymore we don't have to carry the guilt anymore the dart might have made might have hit its target but you can live here and be a completely new person because you've taken a bath in the blood that was shed for that particular purpose that song says, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make my broken heart, fractured life, dysfunctional life, whole again? After what I've suffered, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. What can wash all away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus can I invite you to take a bath in the blood away that sin nothing but the blood of Jesus he's a liar to say it can't be washed away go on one more time just just allow the blood to do a cleansing purifying work in your life father we just thank you thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord what can wash what can wash away my sin 
There's a deep cleansing walk that's going on now, a deep cleansing walk, a very deep cleansing walk. There's a cleansing that's going on from foundations, from foundations, from foundations. And if there is anyone under the sound of my voice who 
hasn't opened up themselves to this wonder working power that is in the blood of Jesus by joining his family by giving your life to him not joining a church but joining yourself with God through Jesus Christ with all heads bowed please if you would slip your hand up if you're listening online then just follow the instructions you want to join this family of God you want to open up your life to the wonder working power of the blood go and slip your hands up wherever you are is there anybody I'm praying for Father we thank you Lord we bless you we give you all the glory all the praise we thank you for your faithfulness Thank you for being just and true to your nature and your promises. We bless you, Heavenly Father. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We declare that you alone are worthy. Worthy to be praised and worthy to be adored. Worthy to be magnified and worthy to be glorified. For of a truth, who is there like unto you, O God? We worship you in this place. The excellency of Israel, we bless you. The rose of Sharon, we worship you. The lily of the valley, we worship you. The first and the last, we declare that you are God and God alone. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The God who is more than enough. The God who answers by fire. The God who sits in the heavens and rules and reigns in the affairs of men. The God who says to the proud waves thus far and no further and they obey. The God who sits on the circle of the earth and the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. The God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The silver and the gold is yours. Once it was spoken and it reverberated, twice we heard and we acknowledge that power does belong to you. The all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing God. The King of all kings, the Lord of lords, the Ancient of days, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Rose of Sharon. You are the God who is high and lifted up, the Exalted One, the Holy One of Israel. We worship you in this place. The uncreated Creator, we bless you, O God. The God who was at the beginning and who will be at the end. The God who was and who is and who is to come. We worship you in this place, O God. For who is like unto you, O God? You are high and lifted up, exalted. Your train fills the temple. We bless you, O God. We declare that you are God and God alone. There is no other God like you, Heavenly Father. We worship you in this place. King Immortal, the only wise God, we bless you in this place. The Excellency of Israel, the ruler of this earth, El Baruch, the jealous God, we worship you in this place. Adonai, the great God, we worship you in this place. Elohim, we worship you in this place. We worship you, O God. Jehovah Rapha, we worship you in this place. Jehovah Rohi, we worship you in this place. Our defense, Jehovah Mekdesh, we worship you in this place. The Lord, our sanctifier, we worship you in this place. We bless your holy name, O oh God, for there is no one like you. Jehovah, the man of war, we worship you. The commander of the heavenly battalions, we worship you. The Lord of the angel armies, we worship you in this place. The Lord of hosts is your name, we bless you. We thank you, heavenly Father. We worship you. We worship you, O oh God. No man takes the glory. We give you all the praise and all the glory for you alone are worthy of our praise and worthy of our glory. Father, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you, O oh God. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We worship you, O oh God. The fountain of life, we bless you. The lily of the valley, we bless you. The bright and morning star, we bless you, O oh God. We thank you, O God, our purifier and our sanctifier. We thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you all the praise. For you alone are worthy of our praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, go on, give him a clap offering. He's worthy. Give him a clap offering. Go on, go on, celebrate him. Celebrate him.
is worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You may be seated in God's wonderful presence. Amen. Amen. After the service, uh, there will be an opportunity uh, for anyone who wants to be prayed with, uh, anyone who wants someone to agree with them in prayer that the past is the past, that the shame is gone, the guilt is gone. Um, anyone who feels that they want a prayer of agreement, a prayer of faith, or prayer of deliverance, as the case may be, even though I know that God has done what he purposed to do. There'll be a ministry time after the pastors and, and the ministers, deacons, deaconesses, will be out here. Um, and you're welcome to come straight up after the service and, and, and we'll join with you in prayer. Um, if you feel that uh, in addition to the prayers, you might want a professional counselor to help deal with certain things, walk with you through certain things. We have a team of professional counselors that are professionally trained. Uh, Dr. Zoe, uh, who heads it up, is a medical doctor by training, but she's given her life to counseling and is done professionally um, in a professional environment. Uh, Pastor Denrile, who you all know as head of Kids First, in her secular role, she runs um, a number of NHS trusts, the pharmacy departments in those trusts, and her passion is counseling. She's gone back to school, she's acquired the skills. And then some people will need mentors, people who can hold their hands, speak into their lives, uh, walk with them. Um, if you're a lady, then the, the Estas Mentoring Scheme, the EMS we run, yeah, it's highly recommended for you to help you in this work. And then if you want more professional mentoring, that's what um, Pastor Funke has dedicated her life to. So there's, there's, there's provision here. You don't have to stay how you are. And if we feel that it, it's gone to the extent that it needs a profess some professional medical advice, we have some of the best uh, psychiatrists, psychologists in this place. You see, they bring the professional angle, but they bring Christ, and that's what makes a difference. Yeah? So don't allow the enemy to tell you you have to stay where you are. The Son has set you free. You are free indeed. Amen? Amen. So God bless you. As we come to the end of the service, we'll worship God with gratitude in our hearts, with our offerings and our tithes. Let's prepare to give our offerings and our tithes as an act of worship. Hallelujah. Let's just be appreciative of the power of the blood as we worship with our tithes and our offerings. If you're a visitor, please don't feel compelled to join this worship. It's a free will offering. There's no compulsion whatsoever. We are glad for the privilege of being able to worship God with our substance. Yeah. 